what dad was going to wear tonight. And he made it known in his simple little way. Jonah chapter 4 is where we're going to be tonight. And what I hope the text gets across tonight for you is a simple fact. And that is that God's mercy exceeds our judgment. It's not too hard to understand that God does things differently than we do. God looks at us different and God acts a lot different than we think he ought to. He's not on our timetable. He's not on our schedule. And quite frankly, we're, he's not the one, he's not the one following us. We're the one following him. My favorite verse of scripture is Isaiah 55 verses eight and nine. And it says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. My mentor and pastor said, put it bluntly, son, God's smarter than you. Listen. In Jonah chapter four, it reads like this. These are the words of the Lord. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceedingly glad of the gourd. Verse seven, but God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day and it smote the gourd that it withered. And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. Then said the Lord in verse 10, thou hast had pity on the gourd for the which Thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? The word of the Lord. Jonah chapter 4 is so interesting. In each of Jonah's four chapters, we see the prophet is in a very different place. In chapter 1, he is running from God. He was told to take a message to Nineveh. He wanted to run away and not do it. So he was running away from God into the storm and gets tossed over side of the boat and gets gobbled up by the fish. He's running away from God. In in chapter 2 of Jonah, he is running to God. He has a prayer of repentance He prays from inside the belly of the fish and repents. So God causes the fish to vomit him up onto the sand. And in chapter 3, as we read from earlier today, he is running with God. He goes forth and does what God has told him to do, to go forth and call out against Nineveh and tell them 40 days and you will see judgment. The people repent. They do what they're supposed to do. And God seeds from carrying out that judgment. Well, in chapter four, Jonah gets a little bit out of control and he starts running ahead of God. He doesn't like what God has done. And quite frankly, I don't know if I've ever met a child of God that was perfectly in tune with everything God allowed or God uh, brought forth. Sometimes we disagree with God because we always think we know better. So sometimes we have those moments where we are like the prophet and sometimes we don't like what direction God has taken us. But in chapter four, it starts off like this. Jonah's anger at God's mercy. It says, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was very angry. Jonah is angry. Why? Because God had mercy on the Assyrians. He had mercy on Nineveh. He saw fit through his judgment. These enemies of Israel deserve to die. They deserve judgment. But after he brought forth his message, the Ninevites repented. 
They did what they were supposed to do. They repented of their sin. They put the sackcloth on. They showed God that they were mourning and they were repentant. And God showed his mercy. Jonah didn't like that. It's a hard thing to admit sometimes. There's certain people we see and something bad happens to them. And you know, we're not always just perfect little Christians. Sometimes we're like, mm, well, I think they kind of deserve that one a little bit. But it's not our place to be. We are not the eternal judge. God is. But, Nina, but uh, Jonah, rather, he's angry at God's mercy. It displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. In verse 2, And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish. He knew this was coming. Jonah knew that God was merciful. It said so in Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. I'll read it for you. It says, And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord God merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. God throughout the scripture to the Israelites through the Old Testament is a God of mercy. Jonah did not want him to be mercy. Jonah disagreed with his mercy. He did not like it. He prayed unto the Lord. He knew this was coming. That's why he fleed to Tarshish. He didn't flee because he was scared of Nineveh. He didn't flee because he was afraid of the Assyrians. He hated the Assyrians. He hated these people because they persecuted his people. It's easy to look at Jonah and be like, man, what a mean guy. Would it be so easy for us to have mercy on someone who killed a family member of yours or robbed your grandpa or stole his land or took advantage of your grandmother? It's a little hard to have mercy on that person, ain't it? They get something bad, we feel like a little bit like, well, they're getting what they deserve. They're a scam artist. They're a criminal. They're a con. God doesn't look at it that way. God looks differently. That's why we follow him, not he follow us. O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? He knew this was coming. Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. So in verse 3, it's hard to imagine a prophet of God saying this. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me. Take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Can you imagine being so angry at God, so in disagreement with God, that you would rather die than live to see him extend mercy? That is, that is a place to get to right there. It's probably not too far for those of us to look at and see. You get to a point where you are just that angry. I see it sometimes. You see these clips of, of people uh, going to court. For like, like criminal court. Like a murder trial. You see someone uh, accused of murdering somebody. And they're on the witness stand. And there's a reason they got bailiffs in the courtroom. Because sometimes the victim's family wants to go ahead and do a little bit of trail justice. I'm going to go handle this. You killed my family member. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come get you. I got this opportunity to get my hands on you. And it, like, it completely disrupts the court. And they got to get everybody out of there. And the cops come swarming in. Because we want to carry out justice in our own way. We got feelings and emotions. And we don't feel like we're ever wrong. God looks at things differently. But Jonah is so upset that God has had mercy on Nineveh. That he wishes for death. Oh Lord, take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. What a place to get to. But then here comes God in verse 4. Then said the Lord, doest thou well to be angry? Doest thou will to be angry? Do you do well to be angry, says God to the upset prophet. Do you do well to be angry? Do any of us do well to be angry? No. No. Anger does not accomplish God's will. It does not. People can take anger and turn it and twist it, but at the end of the day, it does not accomplish God's will. In Genesis chapter 4, 
Verses 6 and 7, we find the story of Cain and Abel. Remember those two. First episode of Family Feud, Cain and Abel. And Cain is upset at Abel just before he's about to go out and commit the first murder recorded in the Bible. And God has a chance and uses that chance to try to intervene. He says to Cain, And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? Why are you angry, Cain? And why is thy countenance fallen? Why have you let your countenance fall? In verse 7 it says, If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. Sin lieth at the door for the Christian that acts in anger, not in God. It's hard to accept. Very hard to accept. It's one of those parts of Christianity, again, that you don't get to a lot of times in church because it's going to challenge something that is your basic instinct. Your basic instinct says, I'm going to give as good as I get. I'm going to give it back to him twofold. It's not what God's telling his prophet here. Again, in verse 4, Then said the Lord to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry? Question. Verse 5, Jonah's going to respond. So Jonah went out of the city. He's this mad. He's got to get out of the city. And sat on the east side of the city. And there made him a booth. And sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. What is a booth? A booth is not like what you sit in a restaurant. In biblical terms, what a booth is is literally like a, like a structure. It's kind of like a, I wouldn't say like a tent. It was a little bit more sturdy than that. But it was somewhere for Jonah to sit where he's not just completely exposed to the elements. It's a little bit of something just over his head. In verse 6, the Lord God, and the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah, that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceedingly glad of the gourd. Gourd is a plant. God prepared this plant, made his, this plant to grow up, and to be a shield over Jonah to keep him from the elements. In addition to this booth that Jonah had built, he had this gourd that God had placed there on purpose. The plant provides shade. Basically, while Jonah's going to sit back and say, well, I called out to this city to repent. Let me just sit back and see what happens. Let me just sit back here. I'm not going to be in the city just in case God rains down fire. I'm going out of the city, and I'm just going to sit here, and let me see how things play out. The Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah. So this gourd is up over him. That it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. And it does deliver him from his grief. Jonah was exceedingly glad of the gourd. It's nice to have a little shade. You hang out in the sun too long, you get a little bit angry, you get a little bit agitated. So God has placed this over Jonah. It's helping his mood out a little bit. Verse 7. But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day and it smote the gourd that it withered. God made this plant rise up and provide shade. And then the next day, God took it away. He caused a worm to come upon it and it, I don't speak Old Testament, it smote the gourd, it killed the gourd. Destroyed it. It was gone in the day. It was, it was here in the day. It was gone the next. Oh, and Jonah's not happy about it. Jonah is not happy about it. But what does the word of God say about things that are given to us by God? Job chapter 1, verses 21 and 22 says this. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. It's another thing that goes against our human condition. We think things are of our own doing when in reality they are of God's doing. Well, what do you mean by that? What, well, I'm the one that gets up and goes to work every day. Ain't that me? It is you. But think about this. Do you bend your knees to get up out of bed and walk down the sidewalk? Who gave you them knees at work? What about them feet? that you stand on all day? Did those just sprout out of nothing? Or were you made and created by God? Do you have a sound mind where you can go to work 
And you can think through problems and you can problem solve and you can go about your daily tasks. Do you have those things? Yeah. Be thankful for it. Not everybody does. There's some people that just, they can't handle it. There's some people that have handicaps or they have different things. There's people that have, you know, have had both legs cut off. They walk on prosthetics. They can't stand on those all day. You got two working legs and two working feet. Is that to be taken for granted? No, it's a blessing from God that you have those things. You are a creation of God. You have those things, but you did not earn those things. You were given those things. But the Lord gives, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. He gave it to you. He's blessed you with it. It's not of your own. Unfortunately, Jonah don't like this very much. God prepared a worm the the morning the next day and it smoked the gourd and it withered. Jonah's not going to take this very well. In verse 8, And it came to pass when the sun did rise that God prepared a vehement east wind. In redneck terms, a really hard, hard blowing wind. I'm talking hurricane level wind. The wind is going to blow hard. Jonah has lost the gourd that was over his head. God took it away. The wind's going to blow hard. A vehement east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted. I don't know how many of y'all have ever been sunburned. I get sunburned a lot. I'm pretty fair skinned and I don't believe in SPF. I put it on at first, but I don't reapply and I get burnt to a crisp and it hurts, especially you get burnt on your back and someone goes to like slap you on the back. Man, it hurts. This is stronger than that. Jonah had the, the sun beating on his head so much that he fainted. He passed out. He fainted. And in fainting and wished in himself to die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. Again, Jonah is just, Jonah is upset. It's all coming from the fact that he did not like that God extended mercy to Nineveh. That's what it all stemming back to. He doesn't like that they extended mercy. He goes and leaves the city. Thinks he's okay out there. He's got his little booth built. God puts a plant over him. God takes that plant away, causes the rain and the sun to come upon him. He's mad again. He's wishing for death again. Wishing for a permanent solution to a temporary problem is Jonah. But God uses it on purpose. Verse 9. And God said to Jonah. This is going to sound a little bit like repeat. God said to Jonah. Doest thou well to be angry? Does it do you well Jonah? To be angry for the gourd? Yeah he's mad about the gourd. God gave him the gourd. It provided shelter. God took it away. Do you do well to be angry? That God took something away from you? And he said. And God said. Uh, Jonah replies back actually and he said I do well to be angry even unto death where I come from that's called back talking your daddy do you do well to be angry Jonah about this gourd and Jonah's like yeah I am oh boy God don't give spankings like mama and daddy does God's, God's judgment and punishment is way worse I wouldn't tempt the Lord like that but that's just where, that's where Jonah is Jonah's that upset Jonah is just angry. And it's all, I keep saying it, it's all coming back to it all starts with Jonah disagreeing with God having mercy on people that he thought were without mercy. They were too far gone. They're enemies of me. I don't want these people to have mercy. That's what it all stems back to. It's like a snowball. It starts off with one thing and just gets bigger and bigger and worse and worse. Verse 10, though, here's the teaching moment. God's going to say to Jonah, then said the Lord, thou hast had pity on the gourd for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. God basically says to Jonah, you felt sorry about this plant. You're angry about this plant when you had nothing to do with it. Jonah didn't plant that gourd. He didn't water that gourd. He didn't go by it at the rural king and dig a hole with a shovel and plant it in the ground. He didn't do any of that. God gave it to him. And God took it away. Well, Jonah's upset. 
And God calls him out on it. Thou hast had pity on the gourd for the which thou had hast not labored, neither made us grow. You didn't labor for it. You didn't make it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. It was a one day blessing. And then in verse 11, and should I, this is the real teaching moment, and should I, should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, Wherein are more than six score thousand persons. That's 120,000 in case you don't speak six score. That cannot discern between their right hand and their left. And also much cattle. Should God, God is saying, should I not have pity on this great city of 120,000 who have not known better? And not just people, but their cattle, the things that they eat. Their, what gets them by. Their economic status. Should I not have mercy on them? God calls out. And it's weird. It's not a lot of books of the Bible that end with a question. But this book does. You had, God is saying to Jonah, you were upset and angry about the gourd that I gave you and I took away. But why are you still angry that I had mercy on 120,000 people and their livestock? The reminder that God's mercy and the way God does things exceeds our judgment. The bottom line is we are not to question God's mercy. What are we called to do? Are we called to be some great mercenary for the Lord? We're called to be merciful. Luke 6, 36, Jesus says, be merciful as your father is merciful. Does that mean getting ran over and not expressing a biblical opinion on matters? No. But we are called to be merciful. Because we are children of mercy. We are the product of mercy. The way things were supposed to work was that the nation of Israel was supposed to be the great nation that was a nation of priests that would lead the rest of the world to the Lord. That's what was supposed to happen. Israel didn't follow through. Israel went after false gods. They demanded a human king. They weren't happy with the theocracy. Throughout the history of the Old Testament, Israel is just on this roller coaster ride with God. They get close to God, they get away with God. And Paul mentions it in his letters when he talks about because he's a Jew going out and being an apostle to Gentiles. And part of what he says sometimes is that I go out and do this hoping to make my Jewish brothers jealous because God has opened up the door for the Gentiles to come in. He makes a provision for Gentiles and foreigners in Isaiah 56. The provision was made even back then to foreigners and eunuchs that if they worship the God of Israel, they kept his covenants They kept the Sabbath holy and they did these things that God would make a place for them. God extends mercy even when we don't want to. And the thing you have to remind yourself is that you must extend mercy. God has called you to extend mercy because he has extended mercy to you. God has been merciful on you when you didn't pray and go seek him. God has extended mercy on you when you cursed his name. God has extended mercy to you, you disobedient child of God. By man's standards, you should not be allowed back in a house of God. You should not be allowed in God's presence. By man's standards. Thank God God's standards are different. God extends mercy. But on the back end of this, now you can take this and you can take it a little bit too far. God's mercy does not extend forever. I read a lot of teachings and have been reading about a section of the Gospels where Jesus discusses the, what's called the unforgivable sin, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And Christians have debated, theologians have debated, they've gone back and forth. Well, what does it actually mean to blaspheme the Holy Spirit? What does it actually mean? Am I guilty of that? Am I guilty of the unforgivable sin? And the more and more I read, the more and more I prayed, I came 
to the following conclusion, and you already know it. The unforgivable sin, besides the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, the unforgivable sin is to die without Jesus. You will not have a second opportunity. You will not have any kind of case to plead. Because you know what? I will have no case to plead before God. No Christian will. Your works don't save you. You are not saved by works. You are saved by grace. My plea would be, when you stand before God in judgment, at the time that it comes, if God stands before you and says, why should I let you in? I have nothing to offer but faith in Jesus. That's all I have to offer. I can't offer up money. You think money matters to God at judgment? You think you can buy your way in? No. Can you offer up property? It's not yours anymore. You're gone from this world. You can't offer up that. Can you offer up some service? No. All you have to offer, God, the only reason, the only thing I'm standing on, God, is that your son Jesus saved my soul and I accept him as my savior and I repent of my sinful way and I trust God and believe and follow your son Jesus. That's the only key that opens the door. There's no works that'll get you there. We are not to question God's mercy because we are called to be merciful and we are products of God's mercy. Well, I don't like that answer. What if I said, oh, I don't like that answer. That don't sound biblically right to me that I should just keep being merciful. What do we want to do? Do we want to get revenge? Is that what we want? Is that going to make us feel better? Are we going to feel better if we just get revenge? What does God's word say? Romans 12, 19 says this, avenge yourself not. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. That's a hard one. I want to pay back my neighbor whose dog trespasses on my property And comes and leaves surprises in my yard. I want to pay him back for that. And I really want to pay back the person who put his hands on my grandmother. That caused her to have to use makeup to cover up bruises and black and blue marks at Thanksgiving. I want to pay him back for that bad. Is it mine to do? Vengeance is Mine, I will repay, says the Lord. It's hard teaching. It's hard to implement. It's literally what God's word says. You still angry? You angry? You upset? Is your anger going to do something good for God? James 1, 19, 20, 19 and 20 says this, For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Think your anger does something to please God? The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Man, it's inconvenient. It's not what I want. It's what God's word has instructed. We're not called to be God's avengers. You think God needs our help? If God wants vengeance, he will have it. Revelation tells us what's coming. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. You think he needs your help doing that? No. But is that a call to just sit back there and and just sit there and be still and do nothing? No. There's work for us to do. As I said before this morning, there's work still to be done. There's a great commission to still be fulfilled. Judgment is not in that. You will know people by their fruits, but you are not their eternal judge. Is it your job to judge them or is it your job to give them the gospel? Is it your job to judge them or is it your God to love them enough to give them the gentle rebuke and tell them the truth that brother, sister, I love you. I love you so much that I'm willing to sacrifice your feelings towards me, but I'm going to be straight up and honest with you. That lifestyle you're living, 
those choices you're making do not honor God. And they might hate you in that moment. It's not for us to decide. Because if we decided who got saved and who didn't, heaven would look an awful lot like a bunch of people that look like us. But God is not just the God of Israel and he's not just the God of one certain people. He is the God over us all and his son died for us all. Judgment is not ours. Well, how am I supposed to act, brother? How am I supposed to go forward? Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 and 32 say this. And I'll back up and read from verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. God's mercy exceeds our judgment of the ones that sit in front of us. His mercy exceeds it. Because if not for God's mercy, we don't even have a seat at the table. We can't even stand in the doorway without God's mercy. We have no business among God without an extension of his mercy. It's one of my favorite things to do is to read through the law. And I don't read through the law to convict people or to brag on how good a Bible reader I am. My accent will tell you I'm never getting hired to narrate a single thing. I actually got turned down. This is a funny story. I applied for a job at 103.3 WAKG in Danville, country station. I was in college. I was like, man, it'd be a cool part-time job, be a DJ. I went in there and read, and I, I, and I went through the application process, and I got denied. And I, I called the program director. I said, uh, you know, I literally, you know, I'm, I'm in college. I, I literally want to just know what, what can I do better going forward. And I literally got told, well, your accent's a little too strong. I told my dad that. He was like, for a country station? <laughs> Wasn't God's plan for me to be there. But I'm going to tell you this. One of the most powerful examples I've seen of mercy exceeding judgment. There was a case some time ago in Alabama. A young man was killed because of the way he looked. He was killed. He was murdered. He was struck down. He was 24, 25 years old. Had done nothing wrong. He was just there. He got struck down and killed because of the way he looked. Awful. Terrible crime. And they knew the guys that did it. They caught them. They they caught up to them pretty quick. They had informants and stuff. Caught up to them pretty quick. Had them on trial. And the killer was on the witness stand. He was getting grilled by the prosecution. He had no alibi. He had no, there was no getting out of this. It was pretty cut and dry. And as he went to stand up, the mother of the victim was sitting right there in the front row of the courthouse. This woman's child had been murdered by someone. Murdered. Not a car wreck, not an accident. Murdered. And as the guilty man came off the witness stand and he was walking back to his table, He looked past his lawyers and he saw the woman. She was sitting right behind where he was sitting at the table, where he was going to be sitting at the table. And I guess he just, he had a moment, maybe the Holy Spirit came over him. He just had a moment where just the guilt just hit him. And he looked back at her and he just whispered, I am so sorry. Probably whispered, he didn't want other people to hear him be that remorseful. 
That woman stood up. Good Christian woman. Stood up. Looked him in his eye and said, I have already forgiven you. He was still guilty in a court of law. And he paid for it with a life sentence. And that's due his crime. But can you imagine? Can you fathom the faith it takes to forgive someone that murders your child? That does not come from human reason. That comes from such a bedrock built faith in God. I aspire to that level of faith in my life. I aspire to it. I look up to that. Because God's mercy is greater than our judgment. Even the prophet had to be reminded in Jonah. And I think sometimes we need to be reminded too. It's not fun getting taken advantage of. We guard our hearts against people that seek to take advantage of us. But just remember, the sinner who stole from you today might be sitting in a church pew next to you one day. Are you going to extend mercy as God would extend mercy to someone that repents and turns away? Or are we still going to just look down our nose and say, unworthy? Let's pray.